Hello, everybody, and welcome to Miskatonic University Radio, a podcast exploring f- fantasy flight games as Arkham Horror the Card Game. I'm Dane. I'm Dan. I'm Ben. And today, we're on chapter four out of five of our like epic journey <laughs> through the player cards of Edge of the Earth. We're almost there. We're, we have one leg left. But today, we're going to be beginning our dive into the multi-class cards. That's right. Some might say One, the meat and potatoes, right? It, or, or even the pears. There could be pears involved for some reason that might become clear later. These, um, <laughs> this yeah, is like I mean, the thing, though, right? Well, it's kind of interesting because this went from being a thing that, you know, w- appeared in one in one box that we didn't know if we'd ever really see again mm. to uh, kind of a major theme in this set. So that's kind of interesting. Um, and it seems like, I mean, I, I don't know if they've come out and, say, and said this, uh, you know, explicitly, but the the best guess is that they chose to go with these multi-class cards partly to enable the synergy mechanic to work a little better and partly to support these kind of like strange deck building rules for the new investigators. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I have a confession to make. When when I have like this archival system of the cards in, in the other room, and uh, when Harrison and I were making the cards for them, he was like, "Hey, should I make one for upgraded multi-class cards?" And then I was like, "I mean, we don't have any. We're probably never going to get any in the future." And he was like, "Yeah, I'll just do it." Now now it's there, <laughs> and I there put them go. directly yeah. in there, so it's perfect. <laughs> Harrison prophesizer. I I just have all my multi class cards uh, crammed in with my neutral cards. I don't I don't have a separate section for them. But there's a That's lot of them answer. in this. There's a lot of them in yeah. this. Like previously I, I there was like, like five, you know. <laughs> I think bef- before this, yeah, you could get away with basically doing anything and it would have been fine because there were five of them and I think like two of them were kind of good, sort of. Uh, but now there's enough that you kinda have to kinda have to actually handle the, the question of how to organize them, I guess. Yeah, I guess the other point to make is that the first time they were they were out, it started as a level zero multi er, multi class card, which branched off into a single color, right? Whereas these are different in that they're just multi class uh, level zero to multi class upgraded, whatever you want. So really, yeah, neat. and and there's also sense. I don't think we'll see any of these today, but there are now tr- triple class cards which did not exist before, right? So I think we'll we'll see some of those in the the final part of our card review episodes. Yeah. Um, for now, though, why don't we begin talking about some of these? Let's do so, it. So, okay, so let's see. So the first card that we have to talk about is Blur, and there's two versions of it. So there's, mm-hmm. it's like Dan was saying, it's a multi-class card that upgrades into still a multi-class card. So um, the level one version of Blur is a rogue and mystic asset that is level one and costs two, and it has an agility icon. It's a spell. And it says, uses three charges, action, if Blur has charges remaining, evade. For this evasion attempt, you may use will instead of agility, and you get plus one skill value. If you succeed, spend one charge, and you may take an additional action this turn. If you succeed by zero, take one damage. Um, So then there's also a level four version, which gains a will icon, and it has four charges instead of three. And the text changes to, so you get plus two skill value when you do the will or uh, agility test. And if you succeed, it says spend one or two charges, and you may take that many additional actions this turn. If you succeed by zero, take two damage instead of one, and both versions take up the arcane slot. So the kind of like initial reaction to this is it's kind of like an alternate version of like Mists of Ryla or Ineffable Truth or one of those. Yeah. Um, it's, it's It's an evade spell. And I would say the the biggest wrinkle of it actually is just that you don't have to use your willpower. You can choose to still use agility. So potentially, it, I guess it, it could be good for characters that have agility. Although in that case, maybe you don't need something special to evade things. Yeah. No. This card. This was one of the first things that was spoiled, right? Um, and the fact that you it's I, I, and I we're, we're gonna see more that do this but the fact that you can use your your um, agility versus your will either one makes it much more um, palatable for a lot of different investigators one specifically the one that I want to use it in is Finn because he can use his extra evade action to dodge something with this and make his basically his his extra action for evading a real action that he can use later or or two. No, he can't take level four, right? No, he can't well, take level four. I don't remember. But yeah. Uh, he can't take yeah, level he, four. Yeah, he... But also, I mean, in that case, not to get too deep into the weeds yet of, like, exactly what decks I should go in, but 
in that case for Finn, you're basically playing a two cost asset that is going to give you like three extra actions over. I mean, I, I guess that could be okay, but I don't know if that's necessarily going to like set the world on fire. Um, can I can I ask a rules master Ben a question about this really quick? I think I know what the answer is, but it says if you succeed, spend one charge, and you may take an additional action this turn. You can't choose to not spend the charge, right? You have to spend the charge. You, yeah, yeah. you have you do have to spend the charge, but you don't have to take the action. See so. that that seems that seems strange to me. It, like I, I'm not saying I'm not saying you're wrong. I think you're right, but I don't like that they're they're like spend to me sounds like the thing that you can choose to do, or it should be part of the cost for something. It's weird to me that like something happens and there's a trigger that you have to spend to charge. But hey, but whatever. I mean, yeah, I, I guess what that kind of means is you know you only get to do this three times, and with the with the level one version, and you get an extra action. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's 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 kind of interesting. I I know I know Dane's excited about this, and I, I think it's an interesting card. My first reaction is I think I still like Mist of Rila a lot better for most of the decks that could take this, just because it's level zero instead of one, which is a big deal. It has an, more charges, which is nice. Uh, instead of getting an extra action, you get a free movement, which a lot of times is what you want to do with an action anyway. If you're evading something, you want to like evade something and move away from it. Like an extra action is a little bit more flexibility, but I feel like the the extra movement gets you what you need most of the time. Um, and I just don't like that if you succeed by zero, take one damage part. That's uh, I feel like Miss of Ryla is choosing to discard a card from your hand. I think pretty often you have a card in your hand that you're basically willing to part with. I really just don't like taking random damage from things if I don't have to, especially if I'm playing a Mystic who often have like five or six health. Who, uh, I'm trying to think, who in this expansion has access to higher level Rogue and Mystic? Norman, Norman and uh, Bob. Bob. What is Bob's agility? Like, does Bob want this to be able to evade stuff? No. Yeah, I, I mean, apart from the thing that, that like Dane it. suggested, where Finn might want to sort of like money launder some extra actions, I think if your agility is higher than your will, probably just don't play this. Like, you, you yeah. probably don't need you don't need this really. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to think of who would want who's not who doesn't have access to Mister Relay that would want to take this. I, I'm pretty so. sure I would take this over Mister Relay almost every time because with that action you can do even more than just just moving. Mist of Relay, you're like forced to move somewhere, and you might not even want to move, and then you feel like you're wasting the charge. Well, you missed... and discarding a card for me is worse because you could only like, if you're playing a Seeker, sure, you might have a billion cards in hand, but if you're playing anything else, like if you're playing a Mystic who who has like wards in hand and stuff like that, you might not want to discard those things. And the action that you have from this is way more valuable than just like a move somewhere else because you could use that action to move somewhere else, or you could use it to like investigate. You could use it to parlay. You can use it to do anything else. And it's, I think that that's much more valuable. It's definitely worth considering the trade-offs. All, all I'm saying is I think that I would say maybe more than half the time you're probably going to move after doing this. So, mm -hmm. you know, in that case, it's the extra flexibility is nice, but it might not be really – it might not be something that you need so badly. But I, I don't know. I mean, I, yeah. I could see it I happening. Mean, you also might not need to move right away, right? Because right. you might want yeah, like, to exactly pick, up, pick up clues first and then move or something. Like, yeah. Um, yeah. I, uh, I, Comment in chat asking, does does the move off of Mist provoke? No, it does not provoke Aelos. It's just an immediate evade. Which is, and then which is really nice. It is good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because with yeah with Mist, you can do this kind of like chains, like surfing through enemies kind of sometimes, which is nice. <laughs> but I, I just really like how Mist's, the extra charge, like the the level zero version has four, and then the upgraded it one does. has five. Totally that's nice. that's very generous. It feels like the, the, the spell that you almost never like wish you had more charges from, you, you just have enough. Um, and I just, I, I like that it starts at level zero instead of this starting at level one. Like, I feel like you're, you're probably going to, unless you're doing one of Dane's weird, like thick of it rabbit hole decks, you're probably <laughs> going to start with level zero miss in your deck anyway. And then what are you going to spend an XP to upgrade from level zero miss to this? Like, I, I don't know. I, I don't think I'd be excited to do that, but like, I, like I said, I, I'm sure there are some decks where you can make a good case for it. Yeah. Yeah. Last thing I want to mention about this card is that the art is baller. This art is so good. It's one, it's one of my favorite arts in the set. I love the implementation of the green and the purple because it's a green and purple card. Safina is one of my favorite investigators, even though I never play her. So, yeah. One of, oh, one of the is, many favorites. That is Safina. I didn't even notice I, that. Oh, she's got like, the do. pink flying around. Oh, that's dope. She does. D does she not look enough like your new Hero Forge mini for you to recognize her? <laughs> no, uh, she doesn't because Hero Forge only had like a giant flower crown. So that's what I assume she always has all the time. I, I kind of wish that we. 
I wish I had a better sense of what the background or setting of this art is, because it seems like she's in some kind of like uh, weird imaginary dream world. But um, I don't know. It's, very, very, it's very kind of yeah. I, I mean, it could be. I don't know. It's just kind of hard to tell. But uh, shall we move on to the next card? There we go. There's there's there been is. there's been so many. Let's do for it those, for those of you watching the video. It's up on Instagram. Uh, yeah, next, <laughs> so next next card. <laughs> Yeah, next card is uh, Brand of Cthulhu. So we spoiled this uh, a while ago, with, along with a few of the other cards. But um, so this is a Guardian Mystic multi-class card. Uh, it is level one. It costs two to play. Uh, it's an asset, and it commits. So the level uh, one version commits for one uh, combat. It's a spell. Uses six charges as an action. You can fight with it. Um, you may use your will instead of your combat and get plus one skill value for this attack. If you succeed, spend one or two charges. Instead of a standard damage, this attack deals one damage for each charge spent. If you succeed by zero, lose one action. Takes up a an arcade slot. So all three of these have very similar text. It's basically just like spend one or two charges to do the thing. And then the level four version of Brand of Cthulhu uh, gains a will symbol. It has nine charges on it. And then action, you can fight. You may use your uh, will instead of your combat. And you get plus two skill value. So that's the difference. If you succeed, spend one, two, or three charges, and then you deal one damage for each char each number of charges spent. If you succeed by zero, lose two actions. So uh, what is like the consensus, I guess, out of all of these spell that spells that do really cool things, but then just do really weird things if you fail <laughs> or, or, or meet the specific criteria, right? We saw in Jackie's pack that it's if you draw a good symbol, uh, something bad happens to you. With the original spells, it was if you draw a spooky symbol, something bad happens to you. And with these, it's going to be if you succeed by zero, lose one action. I don't know what the probability looks like of succeeding by zero. I guess it really depends upon like your base willpower and what, what mode you're playing on, etc. But like this feels like it's not going to happen as much. You... You, right. Yeah, you kind of just pretend that your skill is like one lower than it is, and you kind of you you pretend that you have to succeed by one or more. Yeah, I mean this one like the penalty here, losing an action. If you're in the middle of your turn where you're fighting stuff, that is generally extremely bad. You it's really don't want worse. that to happen to you. <laughs> yes. But I think this is based on how it triggers off of succeeding by zero. I kind of think this is better than a lot of the other ones because, like we were saying, you can probably avoid it when you need to, and then if you're fighting last action then you're fine succeeding by zero because you don't have any actions, so it's totally fine if you succeed by zero. So yeah. in that sense, like even though, I mean, losing two actions on the upgraded one is very scary, but you know you get plus two skill value, it's like just pretend that it's only plus one. And if you're hard motor expert, then probably it's, it's probably, maybe it's not worth it. Maybe you'd rather play one of the other spells. But uh, you know, in, in standard, if you have like a five in your will or your combat base and you, you're boosting it even more, I mean, this seems pretty fine. I wouldn't be very worried about it. Yeah, the neat part about this one is that um, sometimes in Guardian, like you want to go for like the two-handed things. Like, <laughs> there's a certain thing we're going to be talking about in a second. But there's also a lot of other big, you know, like flamethrower, shotgun, all that kind of stuff. And like, as a Guardian, it's kind of an issue. Like, you might need to like put a bandolier in your deck and then get like you know knife in your deck, and that's just that just feels weird. And it's a lot of setup to do that. So this is kind of like the perfect item or, or spell for you rather to like get into a slot that's not normally used. To deal with things that are like smaller or mid-range health that you don't have to like spend a shotgun and a bullet on, which which is really nice. Somebody pointed that out when we initially uh, did our review of it, and and it's it's a really neat sort of alternative to like having to use a weapon slot or uh, yeah. hand slot. Rather. I mean, I like the card because it um, you can control how much damage you do. Like you're not forced to do three damage every yeah. time, like you were are with like upgraded shriveling. So you don't feel like you're wasting the charges as much because like oh there's a four health enemy you know I'll attack it twice for two damage rather than or or once for three once for one, um, so it makes it like it'll last a little bit longer even though it has like effectively less charges than like shriveling five which has four <laughs> charges for yeah, you know, yeah. potential twelve right. damage out of that. But, but but it's also cheaper. It only costs mm -hmm. two, which is really which is honestly a really nice. Th that's excellent, right? I mean, like yeah. this is one of the cheapest weapons. Like even if you're if you're a guardian and you're never going to actually use your will for this and you're just treating it as a weapon, this is similar to like an enchanted blade or something in that it has it's basically like three hits either version, and it doesn't take up your hand slot and it's cheaper. So that's right. I mean e even even ignoring the other stuff it can do, that's really quite good. One downside to it, I mean, I, I definitely think that most of the time you don't want to spend one charge 
Like if you're just hitting something with one charge, unless you're like a mystic and you just want to use your will, you could probably just punch like a cultist or something, right? Right. right. But um, but I one kind of downside to this is you know recharge level four is a really good relatively new card, right? And it can really mm. just completely refresh one of your spells. It's a lot worse than this because if you play that on a shriveling, you're kind of getting you know like four more activations of your shriveling. If you play that on one of this, you're really only getting like one or two, maybe three extra shots, right? Because yeah. so like e each individual, also things like winds of power, like each individual charge is kind of worthless, right? Um, mm -hmm. But you know that that's it's it's so cheap. I mean, you're kind of just playing with house money anyway. Yeah. The other the other weird thing about it, the other weird interaction, I think, is that like these these specific spells. Uh, I think the next one will be a little bit more relevant, but um, these specific spells don't uh, trigger with knowledge's power, right? Not that like maybe Roland could play it, but like. Um, there's, there's another one that's coming up, but like the fact that you have to spend the charges, it's not technically a cost, right? Because knowledge is power, it says oh, that you can yeah. circumvent the cost, but that's you have a good to spend point, the charges yeah. in order to use the, the, the attack, right? For this. I mean, that's okay. Knowledge is power is uh, very, very strong. It doesn't need to work with every single spell. It's not yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and the, the, the people that can use both of them is just like, you know, Luke and, and maybe some other people anyway. Roll and so. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I, I think, it, and one more thing to mention, though, because it is a spell, uh, I mean, Dane and I are playing Circle Undone, you know, there's ghosts, there's enemies mm. that you don't want to hit with, a that, that you need a spell or relic to, to damage them, there's other, there's, like, monsters where if you hit them with a melee weapon, it, it, you know, destroys it or something like that, the fact that this is, like, a spell that is very good and accessible to guardians is pretty cool. Mm. Um, I, I think I, I honestly think there's like a much better I like this a lot better as a guardian weapon than as a mystic like shriveling substitute but I, I think it's reasonably good in either of those capacities I think this is this will be pretty nice for Lily right because it'll let her if, if, if she's not focusing on her willpower if she wants to focus on her combat so she can make use of the level zero guardian cards and then she upgrades into this she can still make use of her upgraded combat yeah um, takes instead up, uh, of that spell slots yeah, instead of yeah, having so these like shriveling or something, dragon pole or whatever. Yeah, yeah, the pole. Yeah, so I think this will be great for her. Yeah. Uh, See, your same... mind's on Lily. My mind's on Diana. Diana it's great for Diana, Diana because Diana, you can Diana can't her... take it though. Can't she? No, yeah, she can. Oh no, sorry, I was thinking Daniela. <laughs> uh, no, uh, no, no, yeah, yeah, uh, uh, not not Daniela. Diana, yeah. because yeah. she has three combat at first, right? She has one mm. will, obviously. And then as she gets more will, she can switch over pretty seamlessly from using uh, combat to using the, her will. It's kind of neat. It's, uh, yeah, it's, a, it, it's a good point. Yeah, and yeah. I, I definitely do... Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I just think it's, it's a really... It, it almost feels like cheating to have something that is effectively just another like pretty good guardian weapon, but it doesn't pick up a hand slot. <laughs> right. Like that almost that almost feels like, huh, interesting. That I wonder why they decided to do that. But hey, I'm not I'm not going to complain about it. Uh, I, I would mention the fact that the lower level version of it is still level one is very annoying. Yes. Um, because that that definitely it means it makes the deck building a lot weirder, and it encourages you to take thick of it, which maybe is okay, maybe is going to get you killed. I don't know, but uh, so, something to keep in mind. Yeah. For sure. Um, okay. Should we move on? I guess. I guess the next card is there is there are more cards in this kind of like series of you know spell assets, but I guess the next one is not one of those. I, yeah, I just realized we I, didn't put them together. I know <laughs> I put them in alphabetical order. Uh, you know that's, that's what right. we ha that's how we live. Yeah, uh, so so instead we're looking at Cyclopean Hammer next. Uh, this is. A, a level five guardian slash mystic asset it costs five to play has two willpower and two combat icons on it it's an item relic weapon melee action fight uh add your willpower to your skill value for this attack you deal plus one damage for this attack if you succeed and the enemy is not elite you may move it one location away from you uh, parentheses if you succeed by three or more instead deal two damage and you may move the enemy up to two locations away from you takes up two hand slots so uh, you, i think you like bananas you guys you guys know in smash when you uh pick up the hammer item and it goes dun, 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 it's, it's kind of like that right this this card is bananas I and I didn't even know at the beginning. I just looked at it and I was like, oh, okay, it's a level it's a level five. It takes two hand slots, it's kinda rough. And then like I played I played with um with, with a couple friends. I played the uh, Symphony of Eric Zahn. And my friend was like, 
when has there ever been another item, just another, any other uh, weapon that's been able to just do three damage? That's it. If, three damage. If, three yeah. damage. Do you remember if, Brand? Brand? Brand was printed at five XP, gives you plus two combat, and does plus one damage consistently. And that's a good weapon, right? This is always better than Brand if you have at least three willpower, which almost every Guardian does have. Well, I mean, if, not if, if you're just not, guardians. If, if you're if you're not like Silas or Tony or somebody, right? Like, there's a lot of people that like, 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 like that's what I'm saying. Like, Brand has to be worse because it's neutral. Like, this is at least a bit restricted to certain classes. Um, yeah. It is, like, yeah. It would be really funny to play this in like Gloria or somebody. Oh, it, we're like, totally oh, okay. You, like, okay, my strength is really low, but I have high enough will. I can be hammer lady. You <laughs> just know, like, why not? Lady hammer. You're a base seven with this. It's it's insane. Throw a guts yeah. two into it. You're just so happy. Because I think it's yeah. If if you're somebody, if you have say like eight combined in your oh your God, combat yeah. and your in in your combat and your your willpower, like you still, I feel like you still want to boost it more. Because if you're not succeeding by by three with this, it's kind of mediocre. I think like it's not really to me. It's not worth five bucks and five XP, um, unless you're pretty consistently succeeding by three. Uh, but if you can consistently succeed by three, then sh sure seems seems pretty cool. Especially. It's really good. Like how how good do you guys think the kind of push enemies away thing is? Like, I feel it's, I, I, it it seems good, but I could see it being like really 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 good in a way that is kind of like hard to it's hard to know until you've tried it. Yeah. So this is the thing, right? Because spoilers for Blob. One of the Blob uh, rewards is is a weapon that does exactly this. It's a gun that when you shoot and, and succeed by a certain amount, it will push enemies away. But the effect is not may. The effect just happens. And it's incredibly annoying when you have a really big enemy and you expect, expect to see, succeed by a lot, you draw minus five, suddenly you're, you're pushing them a location away and doing two damage. Now that enemy is just gonna hunt right back onto you, which sucks. <laughs> it's really bad. Yeah. And I, I immediately didn't like that weapon whatsoever. But this, I, I read that as, oh, this is just that weapon again. But the May ability on this, mm -hmm. just you don't even ever have to use that ever. You can, yeah, and it's but... fine. Sometimes you might get like the Apex Wrangle Vine or whatever, one of those big chunky enemies that's not elite, and you can just like kick it to the beginning of the map, <laughs> and it's just like behind you. You don't have to worry about it ever, you know. Yeah. So like, I mean, it's it, kind it, of a neat ability. It's pretty nice for not for non hunter enemies, right? Because you'll just whack them away. Ones, yeah, the, big, the beefy health ones. Oh yeah. Um, the cool use for it is that if you're if you're on the uh, the train, and you use this to smack an enemy back into the last train car, <laughs> and then the train car gets sucked up, that's the pro strats right there. That's that that's is what, that that's is pretty cool. Style points. Uh, you could use it. You can use it in horror and high gear to knock enemies back. Yes. To make that get sucked there should back. there should be a thing where if the enemy reaches when you push an enemy two spaces, if it hits an enemy that's already there, it like pushes that enemy two, and it's like uh, you guys ever play you guys ever play croquet? Croquet is fun. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's great. Yeah, no, and, and one last thing I would say is, uh, you know, there's not too many weapons that never run out of ammo that are good, right? Like the the holy spear that we just saw is one of them. Yeah, those are good opportunities to play like upgrades, like enchant weapon and those sorts of things. So that's you know it, just another thing you could you could do with this is you could put it play it in that kind of deck. There's some decks that could play maybe like this and the holy spear and the sledgehammer and just have like you're probably going to draw one of your giant two-handers pretty quick and then that's just your weapon and you can just hit everybody with it and you're going to have a pretty good time yeah the interesting thing about this though is that like if you're comparing it to holy spear holy spear has like i feel like it's more balanced because holy spear kind of has the balancing act of like having you know you can do two damage pretty consistently and then when you yeah. want to do use it for the three damage you have to pull the, the pluses back or something like that you right. don't even have that stipulation with this. You just have to succeed by a lot. You just have to have that stats, which like Mark gonna have the stats. You know, yeah. like even uh, somebody like like when Diana gets her stuff up, she's at six will and three combat. She's at a nine base. That's nuts. Again, only thing I would say though is I really do think if you're playing say hard mode with this, you really want your combat and your will to be as high as you can possibly get them. Because again, yes. if you're not if you're not succeeding by three with this. I think it is really not a great use of five resources and five XP. Like you, you want to be able to succeed by three against an enemy with pretty high combat difficulty, like pretty much whenever you want. Otherwise, I'm not sure how good this is. But if you can, then it seems very good. Yeah, really cool weapon. I love it.
let's uh let's move on and talk about another kind of new uh spell asset so we've got divination so like the other ones this has a level one version and a level three version uh the level one version is a uh, seeker and mystic asset uh cost three uh has a intellect icon it's a spell and an augury it says uses for charges and it says action investigate for this investigation you may use willpower instead of intellect and you get plus one skill value if you succeed, spend one or two charges. Instead of discovering a clue at your location, discover one clue at your location for each charge spent. If you succeed by zero, choose and discard a card from your hand. It takes up the arcane slot, or one arcane slot. And the level four version gains a willpower icon. Uh, it goes from four charges up to six. And you get plus two skill value instead of plus one. And if you succeed, you may spend one, two, or three charges, and you get that many clues. And if you succeed by zero, instead of choosing and discarding one card, you choose and discard two cards from your hand. Uh, what do you guys think about divination here? I, Dane, didn't you make a... I think I remember you making a deck that was trying to use this. Although that might have been... You might have been deep in the that. bowels of rabbit hole frenzy. Or rabbit yeah, hole yeah. Madness. Yeah, that, <laughs> no, that was... <laughs> <laughs> I didn't actually end up using it. I haven't used it quite yet. I've never taken it. And the thing is, is that, like, weirdly enough, normally, like... The, the anything that picks up clues is like better than things that don't pick up clues right and like this is like almost weirdly the 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 least this, appealing one this, to me of the cycle this seems really bad just based on the numbers it's so on weird it. yeah because yeah. like normally like, a secret card is like hey you know, this is this clues. is like a worse right of seeking or clairvoyance that is a little bit cheaper is what it seems like to me so the neat thing i guess and maybe the part of the balancing act here was because like uh seekers already have access to like clue compression right like they have they have deductions they have like you, you know all the research stuff that you can get extra clues with like really quickly like um guiding stones and stuff like that. or whatever yeah yeah so there's a lot of those already in the class so like this is adding even more to that so maybe that was a consideration being like we already know that seekers can pick up clues really really well how good do we want to make this like if this if the level one version came in with six charges it still would just be kind of be like yeah that's all right i'll take it you know, like, if, if I'm playing a mystic who's just only doing seeker stuff, sure, I'll take it because I've got, like, you know, you've got your uh, your right of seekings, your um, clairvoyance, and now you have a divination. And personally, I really don't like right of seeking at all. I don't like the, the, the fact that you can just lose your entire turn. So I'm probably more comfortable playing this. That's just a personal thing, though. Maybe, you know, I'm just going to be playing this and that because I didn't really like taking six cents when I, when I don't have to, but... I mean, you, you also don't like choosing and discarding a card from your hand, you were saying earlier. Right? That's, that's, so that's another thing. Yeah, yeah. This, um, that's kind of like why it's the least appealing to me. I you definitely I mean? don't like choosing and discarding two cards from my hand if I succeed by zero <laughs> yeah. with the upgraded one here, but I don't think I'm ever going to play the upgraded version of this. So, no, I, yeah. I mean, if you just compare level one divination to level zero clairvoyance or right of seeking, so those have three charges, but each charge gets you two clues. Right. And th this one, you basically, like, this is basically you're paying $3 and a card and an action to be able to spend two more actions and get four clues and you know right of seeking is is you're paying i think one more resource but you get to use it an extra time that that just seems way better like i just i don't it's so crazy to me that the numbers on this are what they are like if this at least costs like two like the other ones do like uh like brand and blur yeah. then you could maybe make an argument for it but it, it yeah. costs more than those and it's it's like worse compared to the equivalent mystic assets yeah, and, and this is where the notable argument of, like, well, knowledge is power doesn't work with it comes really into play. Because, like, people like Luke love to use knowledge is power with, like, clairvoyance and right of sure. and all those yeah. kinds of things. Yeah. This, you can't do that with. So it's, like, yeah. that's another kind of knock against it in that pool, I think. And, I, think and I, I, I guess trying to play devil's advocate and say anything good about this card, um, <laughs> I guess one thing you could say is that with right of seeking, upgraded right of seeking, sometimes it's like, oh, I, I want to use it, but there's only two clues on this location, and it's kind of a waste. With this, if there's a location that only has two clues, you get to save a charge, and maybe you get to use it again later. So, but that's not worth it. Like it's it's you, at most you're probably saving the difference in charges from just playing this versus the other spell to begin with. Yeah. If you're yeah. if you're playing like two player or something though, where a lot of locations don't have three clues on them, is this a little bit more tempting then? Just because you're. I, you will get I, three uses out of it, and it's a little bit cheaper I, to play. I think, than... right of, I think Right of Seeking or Clairvoyance 2 is probably still better than Divination 4, <laughs> or, or or it's like as exactly as good, and it's 2 XP less. Right? Like, like, I guess this is a little bit cheaper, but it costs a lot more XP. 
So yeah. I would I would probably still go with like clairvoyance mm -hmm. level two over divination level four. I was gonna say the clairvoyance level three, but right, right. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. I was gonna say the the what it has in its court is that it's a level four card that you can spend three charges to get three clues, and that's pretty important for three player. Like three player, there's just a weird number of cards that have like that the exact multiple of numbers of clues right. that are on locations. So that's what this has going for it. If you're uncomfortable with using right of seeking for the reasons that I am. Maybe use this. But, you know, you definitely don't want to discard your cards from your hand. <laughs> Please don't do that. Yeah, so, well, yeah. And, and, and same, if you're a mystic, again, same restriction we mentioned earlier where um, not being able to, like, recharge your winds of power very efficiently on this makes it makes a big difference. Because, yeah. like, recharge level four has become, like, a pretty staple card in kind of, like, red mystic decks that I play now. And uh, it just doesn't work very well on these spells. Wait, doesn't, doesn't recharge level four reach up refill all the charges? No, it adds four charges. Oh, um, it, it if you if you don't draw if you draw a scary symbol, it adds one. If you don't draw a scary mm, symbol, it gotcha, adds four. Gotcha. At least I'm yeah, pretty sure. Not... Um, yeah, that, yeah, that's, that's not great. <laughs> All right, let's let's move yeah. on though. We got another kind of interesting multi-class uh, arcane asset. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think it's the last one of this cycle um, of of spells that that do things like this. Uh, this is Earthly Serenity. So this is a Mystic and Survivor card. Um, it's an asset, costs two to play, um, commits for a will symbol, has the type spell, uses four charges, uh, action, test one will. For each point you succeed by, you may spend a charge to heal a damage or a horror from an investigator at your location. If you succeed by zero, lose one resource. And then the level four version, it's, it now has two will icons. It has six charges as opposed to four, and you test zero instead of testing one. Um, and then you uh if you succeed by zero you lose two resources instead of one so those are the differences here um and so this card is is kind of in direct competition with clarity of mind and with healing words right those are like the the mystic cards that heal stuff notably this is a survivor card that heals stuff um which is really neat because they really didn't have a lot of options for that am i right before this i mean now they have bandages they they have a lot of ways to soak and they, and have, prevent, they, had fewer, yeah. they had fewer ways to heal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is, I feel like, pretty good in the addition to the survivor pool, but how does it fare in the mystic pool? Like, would you take this over clear, uh, clear, Clarity of Mind or something like that? I mean, uh, how many charges does Clarity of Mind have? Four? This four. Clarity, the, uh, the upgraded one, which is the only one that we really bother playing usually, right. is lo level three and has four charges. And each one heals two horror, and you don't have to do a test. And it, you can split it, right? Yes. But, so, so yeah, it's tough to say. Like the, I think definitely Clarity of Mind is better than this in some ways. I'm, I'm basically comparing level three Clarity to level four Earthly Serenity here, because I think that those are kind of the good versions of these. Right, right. Um, but I, I just want to mention... Um, so the fact that this can heal either horror or damage is is a lot of flexibility. Yes. Like, yeah. I, I think as a typical, you're playing like Agnes or something, you don't really want to put an entire card in your deck like a leather coat or something just to try to keep you alive because you're not expecting to take damage. But if things go wrong and you do end up and you can't deny it or whatever, then and you, you kind of get down in a hole and you're worried you're going to die, it would be nice if the thing that you put in your deck to kind of keep your Agnes like horror engine going could in a pinch be used to heal damage as well like that is a nice yeah. bit of flexibility there both agnuses like it right even parallel agnes does because heals damage right yeah because a lot of mystics you know they have low uh low health a lot of times so they might just get to have a bad luck on a um not rotting remains grasping hands or something and yeah. then they're kind of like really scared that they're going to die um the other thing i would right. mention so the fact that you have to do a test obviously bad in you know expert or something and bad if there's really scary symbols but it can be an advantage because if you succeed by a lot instead of spending a ton of actions to just hit this over and over again like with clarity of mind and agnes a lot of times you're like okay i spend my whole turn to heal six horror um with this if you can just succeed a lot maybe commit a guts or something then you could just you could, you could just use it all up immediately and there's some people not many but maybe like dexter who can play cigarette case and they might like to have an opportunity to pass a test by a lot you know yeah. yeah totally i mean importantly this you can split up the healing on this as well right like you could do yeah you could play this and then do a big test so you trip all six at once and you know dish out healing and healing to your team you also could dump more charges on this 
with recharge if you want, and then so, <laughs> try to pass with like ten or something and do a giant burst. You yeah. Know? So, so a quick question here: When you say you can split it up, when you let's say you succeed by three, so you can spend three charges and do that. Mm-hmm. Can you, if you have like three people, can you heal one horror from one person, a damage from another person, and a horror from yep. you? Doesn't matter. Oh wow, yeah, that's cause, great. Yeah, because it's a for each point you succeed by. So that's the decision you make for each point. And then it all yeah. applies. It all applies simultaneously if, if that is relevant or something. But but but, but of yeah. course, unlike unlike some other healing sources, not many, you cannot mm. heal allies or other cards. You can only right. heal investigators. Yeah. Uh, but but clarity of mind is the same way. Yeah yeah. This this has the versatility. The downside might be that you have to do the test. Um, mm. but the person that I was actually just kind of came across this card from was Carolyn. Because yeah. Carolyn can take this card. And like heal her weaknesses, she, notorious she, for being really annoying. I, I don't, I I don't care to, about that. I want to play it on Carolyn and give everyone a dollar by healing one get one action. Yeah, that's also <laughs> true. Yeah, that's but true. like this is a burst. You can just burst your weakness straight off of you in mm-hmm. one action. Technically, if you succeed by enough, right? I yeah. I wanted to ask about that because it doesn't say heal horror. It says heal one damage or one horror. But I guess that counts. It's not literally those two words consecutively. It's mm-hmm. like if right. you can use it to heal horror, then. Yeah, yeah. Um, I and Carolyn can take this. Yeah, you can. Yeah. One one last thing to say. So just in terms of the flexibility we were talking about earlier, remember the new weaknesses that we talked about. The basic weaknesses where you have That's to heal. That's also true. If anybody in your group has one of those, then they are going to be very very happy if you have one of these in your deck or, or if they still need it because the fact that it can kind of you know just heal one ping of damage or horror off of somebody who just drew one of those could be really good so yeah yeah i don't know i don't think there's like a slam dunk like this is always better than clarity level two in like mystic decks but i think it's definitely competitive with it and there's other decks like survivor decks that if they want to heal for some reason this is the only game in town and it'll be pretty good for them yeah i agree yeah plus I mean, the art, art again is pretty baller right does uh does daniella like this as an option yeah, really to heal art. herself because she does yeah. have four willpower she does have four will Kind of. I mean, I I think the I mean I think the Peter and Jess combo is probably just better, but That's this true. could be this this could be all right as like well one of yeah, like a backup. Well, if, maybe, maybe you commit it sometimes. I mean, if you want to run different allies other than Peter and Jess. Oh yeah, um, like a Quinna. Like a Quinna. Yeah. Like Guard Dog is a fun combo with Daniela, because uh, you can, you know, you do two damage every time he gets bit, basically. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, it's just kind of. I mean, think 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 about Carolyn who like really wants to heal a lot. Um, a lot of horror as we've kind of played carolyn decks over the years we've trended more and more towards instant healing from um like ancient stone or solemn vow plus plus peter because it's just so much better when you don't have to actually spend actions to, to heal stuff that's why for daniela yeah, i would like true. probably still i think you probably would still rather have peter and jess but yeah. you know for, for agnes agnes can't soak the horror because she wants to actually take it on her investigator card exactly. so like and and there are other cases like that too. So yeah, I, I think this is really solid. And it could also be yeah, like if you have a if you have a marker to nail it in your group, maybe you play this and maybe you you know can can heal it on them and let them use their ability more. So yeah, question: If you succeed by f- like five, let's say, can you mm-hmm. choose to only use three charges if somebody only has three damage on them, or do you lose all five charges and heal three damage? No, you can you can. Uh, you can it says for each point you see by you may spend one charge. Okay, yeah, so rather, each time you un- would go to spend a charge, it's a may. Yeah, so unlike the okay. whatever the previous question that was relevant he asked, uh, you you don't have to spend the charges. Nice. So yeah. I like it. Very versatile. Let's let's move on. So we've we've discussed some some assets that take up our on our cane slot and some assets that take up two hand slots. Let's talk about <laughs> an asset that takes up all of those. Okay, no los dos. Los tres. <laughs> those traits <laughs> so uh so this is the enchanted bow uh it is a level two mystic slash survivor asset cost three to play has a willpower and agility icon on it it's a, ble- a spell blessed which of course means mateo could already take it weapon <laughs> and rage uh uses three charges action exhaust enchanted bow fight you may either use either willpower or agility instead of combat you get plus one skill value for this attack. This attack deals plus one damage. As an additional cost to initiate this ability, you may spend one charge to have this attack target a non-elite enemy at a connecting location. If you do, ignore the aloof and retaliate keywords for this attack. And it takes up two hand slots and an arcade slot. 
It's a lot of slots. <laughs> this is this is this has like some of the I would say the weirdest rules text of a card that we've seen. I, in a while. I know. Does my my first question? Does knowledge's power work with this? Because uh, spending a charge is part of the cost, but it's an additional cost. So I feel like maybe you can't say uh, you can't say like oh I spent it even though it didn't have charges on it. You know. You, you could knowledge's power to just do a normal attack, but not to do the ranged attack. Mm, that's what I thought. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which it's only level two. Like this, this is like lower than even the existing yeah. uh, ornate bow, right? Yeah, right, which, right, right. Which means it's a lot of people have have access to it. Level two, even though yeah. it's mystic survivor. Um, I mean, it is a. Yeah, it has charges. So if you have a way to refill the charges, um, which I guess mystics do. I don't. I don't know if survivors really do. Do they? Um, I mean, you, you might then... not need. You might not need charges that often. Like you only you only need charges when you're trying to snipe something oh, yeah, in a right. different location. Right. Exactly. Yeah. That that's one thing. The, like the, the three so might that's be the enough. Upside, right? Yeah. That's yeah. the upside. Is that is that it, this just will deal one damage and one uh, give you plus one combat for the attack or, or whatever you're you're testing. The downside, I think, the biggest downside of this is that it it exhausts. So you can yeah. only use it once every every uh, phase or whatever. Unless yeah, that... you're Ash can right that's that's straight up sucks like it, the fact that it exhausts it's rough yeah i i would add uh taking up so many slots is also just really bad like even mystics you'd think okay mystics don't need their hand slots as much as like guardians do but you know you've got grotesque statue you've got astronomical atlas you've got the book that draws a bunch of cards you got uh, mystics have a lot of pretty good hand assets that you you basically have to give up all of those to play this over like shriveling or something and it's like yeah well yeah you could just play shriveling you know but yeah. can you act of desperation a shriveling? That is true. You can't. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, mean, I, well, I don't know if that's oh, okay. worth trade off. So, <laughs> probably so, your so, players out there. <laughs> so suppose you're suppose you're never going to spend charges off of this thing. In that case, I would argue it's it's not really very good, right? For for the reasons we mentioned, it exhausts. It takes up more more slots. Um, it's it, it's like a a shriveling that never runs out of charges, but it's it's kind of worse, and you can only use it once per turn. Uh, but how good do we think like sniping something from an adjacent location is? Because there are other there are other weapons that can do this. I've never tried playing one of them. I don't really know how good that is exactly. There's like a weird percentage of scenarios that have things spawn at connecting locations, empty locations, aloof things, right? Like birds, whippoorwills, all those kinds of really annoying things. That said, like the whippoorwills aren't aren't the greatest thing to use this on because they only have one health. But like, there's yeah. just sometimes where this. Around comes in pretty clutch um you you must use your will or your agility so you can't really like you know vicious blow the thing um but it's kind of cool because it means it doesn't retaliate against you you know there's just there's a lot of really interesting applications for it but the investigator that i was thinking about the most honestly was like the one that we all play the least which is rita because she can actually use this and she has a really high agility stat, and she can finally use it for something that's like kind of a pretty good weapon, right? I mean, I in, guess like in the survivor context. I, I guess compared to the ornate bow, which is another kind of Rita weapon, the ornate bow doesn't exhaust, but you do kind of have to reload it. Yeah. So with this, nonsense. with this, it's you can kind of think of it as like you're getting one free one free shot every turn, but you can't get more. Right. Um, but keep in mind, the ornate bow also does three damage, and this only does two. And I think the Ornapo gives you a higher bonus to to the to the test as well. It adds your agility, yeah. Yeah. Oh, so it, add, like, it adds your agility. No, I, I thought it was you use your agility and it gives, gives you plus two or three or something. Yeah, oh, it gives it, you, you use agility and you get plus two agility and plus two damage. Yeah, so, I don't know. This I think where I come down on this is like, I'm I'm not really sure that I want to give it a try, but I would respect anyone that makes that makes the attempt to try to make this work because it, it it's a yeah. very interesting card. Yeah. Bonus points if you're playing in Yorick, you take a Bandolier, level two, and you get two of these babies out with oh, it's four gross. hand slots and two spell slots. That's just gross. <laughs> Somebody's got to do it. <laughs> and so again, it, it's not going to be any of us. <laughs> well, and it is a spell. You can kill the ghosts. You can kill the ghosts in uh, TCU. So. And, yeah. and you get two attacks every turn. You only have... No, that seems like it might be, that might be hard to pull off. But it could be yeah. fun. It is very funny to... 
uh, like use use a bandolier to to be helping All right, shoot we, bows. We, we have now exhausted the maximum length of time that I'm willing to spend discussing cards that are not Eon Chart. It's time to discuss Eon Chart. <laughs> uh, it, yeah, that, that's right, folks. It's 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 uh it's time for the main event. Secret card, Dan. Oh man, I'm I'm so excited for this. Oh, hey, it's also it's also a road card, Dane. You should be excited for this. Yeah, aren't aren't you excited to play this in some super good, uh, you know, Jenny deck or something? Uh, I'm excited okay. to see this card for maybe about three months, and then for it to be thrown on the taboo list, murdered by another yet another yet another casualty to Mandy. Like Dane, Dane, it uses it costs secrets to do anything with this. That's oh, an inherent God. limitation that will prevent this from being abused. I guess once you run out of secrets. <laughs> Look, Dane, do you see the art here? This this guy chilling out, sitting in a boat, looking at this cool tablet with swirls on it? That's going to be me. That's what I'm going to be doing in every game of Arkham I play for the next couple of years. So I'm going to be chilling out in my boat, looking at this thing, being like, oh, look at that swirl over there. Oh, yeah. Do you wanna, look at that neon. Do you want to read the card? <laughs> yes, yes, I do. I really do, Ben. Uh, okay. So Eon Chart is a uh, is a seeker and rogue asset. There's a level 1 version and a level 4 version. I'll read the level one version first. It's a cost two asset with a uh, intellect icon and an agility icon. It's an item and a relic. It says uses three secrets, and it has a fast trigger. During your turn, exhaust Eon Chart and spend one secret. Choose and take one of the following actions: move, evade, or investigate. And it takes up an accessory slot. The level four version gains a wild icon. And the fast trigger uh, is exactly the same, except the the payoff is choose and take two of the following actions in any order, move, evade, or investigate. So it gains an icon, and whenever you activate this if, for the cost of a secret, you can do two actions instead of one. Um, so the main reason, I would say the main reason I'm excited about this, besides this cool guy chilling out in a boat in a lake looking at a thing, yeah. is that it's kind of like a combination of, it's like a pathfinder that also lets you investigate without spending an action. Uh, limited, so that, right? yeah, yeah, well, uh, yeah. If only, if only there were some way to fit more <laughs> secrets into something. I can't quite imagine what that would look like, but uh, if only there were like a single card, say, a, say a card that doesn't even cost any resources and it doesn't even take up a slot that you care about, that lets you basically just like spend a resource every turn to get a free secret. That would be a neat combo with this, but unfortunately, I can't, <laughs> I can't think whether such a card even exists, right? I'm talking. I'm talking about twine, folks. I'm talking yeah. about the area of this twine, uh, which basically, effectively, is a is an arcane slot seeker asset where uh, you can exhaust it each turn to like turn one of your resources in your resource pool into a secret, and then you can spend it on anything that uses up secrets. So as long as you have those two cards, you can basically activate Eon Chart every turn for free. And there's other ways to put secrets on things too, like a Sounding Revelation and other stuff, but. I would say Twine is the one that is like the most just obvious, really good combo with this. Mm. Yeah. So this... Are you mostly excited about the level one version, or do you also like the level four version? I I'm very excited about the level one version. I'm I'm a, like a little bit skeptical of the level four version because if I read this right, you must choose and take two. Like you can't just choose one, right? right. And if there was no, suppose there was only one enemy at your location and it wasn't engaged with you, then you couldn't choose evade, right? Mm. And suppose, basically, you might end up like wasting one of the actions or something. Like, oh, sure, I, sure. I can see like, that. you're definitely, you know, two actions generally is better than one. But I feel like this would not be, there's so many other amazing, uh, very good seeker cards to spend <laughs> XP on. This would not be super high on my list to upgrade. Like, I would probably spend XP on a lot of other stuff first before I would upgrade this. Because the, like, level, um, the level one version Monty. is like almost as good. Yeah. 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 yeah that is kind of. You also could play two, get a Relic Hunter. You could just buy a Relic Hunter for uh, three experience and then have two of them. <laughs> yeah, two of them. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, that, that, that has occurred to me. Um, well, because. <laughs> well, it, it competes with the Lucky Cigarette cases, though. Uh, well, well, so <laughs> that's, that's the thing is, I mean, this does, like, there are some other good. There are some other good accessory slots for some secret decks. I mean, Pendant, obviously, we've just talked a lot about in a recent episode, but we're, we're, we're probably, like, soft banning that or whatever, so Sorry, forget about it. Yeah, yeah for, forget about Pendant for a minute. Um, but, you know, there, there's things like, I mean, I guess Tooth of Esli isn't really very competitive with this. You just play this every mm -hmm. time. But, um, you know, there are other accessories that you would kind of be giving up. Um, well, I mean, so 
here's a question for you. If you couldn't recharge the secrets on this, does this compete with other things? Uh, I would be a lot less excited about it because, like, in a secret deck, something that I'm actually going to spend an action to play has to be really good because I have so many cards that I don't even have to spend an action to play, right? Yeah. Like, if I, if, I, if I spend an action and money to play a card that then gives me basically, like, three free actions... I don't. I don't really know how incredibly excited I am about that, um, but if it's a thing where I can replenish it and do it every turn, like Pathfinder, then it's great. And I love the flexibility because there's some turns where you really want to move. Like these days, I usually don't play two Pathfinders anymore because they cost a lot of XP and they're kind of expensive and they're kind of slow. But I, I really love playing one Pathfinder. You know what I would also really love is playing two Pathfinders, but one of them can also be like a free investigate thing instead of a Pathfinder, right? <laughs> like. That's great. So I, I think like one of these and one Pathfinder on your board is that's going to feel really good. Like that's what I want. Yeah, I, I, I guess the thing that the thing that is is kind of odd to me is that like seekers are the class that well they basically do everything, but like rogues are the class that get yeah. extra actions. Right, that's their thing. Mm -hmm. Like like yeah. they get action extra actions to do a bunch of mediocre stuff. Exactly. And then like yeah. seekers. Okay, I guess I guess seekers could just like have five actions every turn for the rest of the game, like with with the level four version anyway. Like you you just have five actions forever. <laughs> they don't need that. <laughs> well, so let me, let, me, let me let me let me turn that around on you, Dane. From your perspective as a, a person that for some reason likes to play far inferior rogues, are you excited to play this in any rogue decks? Uh, I mean, I think this is a good card. Right? Well, like, obviously, I have Lucky Cigarette Case, so it's directly competing with Cigarette Case, which is going to get me more value, generally, if I don't have a way to do the secrets, which I don't. That's the so. thing, is as a rogue, you don't have access to Twine. So it's yeah. it's basically like... It's, it's literally a secret card. Yeah, and, and you also, as a rogue, I think... Well, I mean, unless you had, like, upgraded Cigarette Case with Astounding Revelation or something, it would be sort of hard to... Like you could maybe have a Tony deck that does that. I think that would be hard. Like if you're a ro yeah, if you're a rogue, you're probably yeah, not true. you're probably not abusing the secrets on this unless you really come up with some creative stuff. Yeah. So yeah. I think it is worse for rogues because of that and the cigarette case thing, like you mentioned. But it's not. I don't. I don't think it would be crazy to play this in a rogue deck. It's just it's not as yeah. naturally incredible as it is for seekers. So I mean, the the nature of these things is that they're multi class. Being like this, the, the level one version can go in so many different decks right it's not even just rogues it's like wendy can take this dexter can take this like so many different people can take this like and dexter i could totally see using a on chart level one because uses all the three secrets you know suddenly it's a david renfield right like, oh yeah that's that, that's a that's a pretty good point actually this could be pretty good for dexter i mean he, can, um, although, he can't take an investigate action though right well no, I, was, like a move, right? well I was gonna say i think um couldn't he use it to activate like a right of seeking or something Oh, is it? Is this like yep. the uh, like haste kind of? Oh man, that's really yeah, really. It's, silly. it's not telling you to take a basic one of those. It's well, just and, and and not only insane. well and that's if you it, here's the thing, if you had haste, this would like if you had the level four <laughs> four version of this, it would like immediately trigger it, right? <laughs> it would, yeah, right? Because you, know, you, you are Aeon chart you investigate twice. Yeah, you're, 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 you investigate haste. That's you're, you're pretty sweet because you are taking the action. Yeah, exactly. You are taking it. But it also means that you see, this is why I'm kind of a little bit worried about the level four version is you do provoke AOOs with these oh, yeah. actions. Yep. Yeah. Um, if, well, if they're not, evade. except for, yeah, except for evade. So like you could be in some really weird position where like there's an alert enemy on you and you have to either like evade it or move and either way you're going to die. Like in that case, you just don't activate it, but it's that, that, you know, you could come up with some kind of trap scenario like that. Yeah, yeah, no. This is really good. <laughs> this is really, really good. Yeah, this is this is like since we started giving spoilers for these cards, this is one where I was like, oh yeah, there's the overpowered card in Edge of the Earth. There it is. <laughs> yeah. Ding ding ding. And uh I'm I'm excited to give it a try. Especially now that I, I really wanted to fit this into the crazy good Mandy deck that we did in Innsmouth, but I kind of just couldn't quite get it in there. Um yeah, yeah. but that now that it's so hard for you. Yeah, I know. I, I really cried <laughs> about it a little bit. But uh, you know, but but now that we're now that we're kind of like soft banning pendant and I think there's other seekers besides Mandy where this is a little bit stronger. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm really excited to give this a try at some point. Maybe in uh, Monterey Jack. That, that would be fun, too. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Ready to move on to the next card? Have, you, have you looked at this card for enough yet, Dan? 
Are you ready to move uh, on? I, I can always come back and look at it later. It's fine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the next card uh, we have is Ethereal Slip. This is, uh, is this the first event that we've done? Yeah, it is. It's, uh, the, it's I think it's the only event out of all the multi-class <laughs> Is it really? Cards. Oh, wait, I, I didn't think, even notice. I think every other one is an asset. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so this is, this is uh, allegedly the only multi-class event card in the set. It is a... Uh, Rogue and a Mystic multi-class event. Cost two to play. So there's two versions. One's level zero. Uh, this level zero version has a will icon and an agility icon on it. Uh, it is a spell and a trick, which means some things. Uh, choose a non-elite enemy at a revealed location up to two location connections away. Swap places with that enemy. And it says now for my next trick. And then um, the level two version of it... Uh, so the cost is dropped by one. It gains an agility icon. Uh, and it says, choose a non-elite enemy at any reveal location. Swap places with that enemy. Uh, so what do you think about this card? So you need Dexter um, bluff, right? It's a trick. So Vita can take it. I don't know if that helps uh, so much. It, uh, <laughs> uh, it could, Safina could put it under whatever. Uh, Parallel Agnes can do parallel agnes things that i forget yeah. how that works uh it? it feels like it might it could be um like good tech for like forgotten age to adopt mm -hmm. a lane like maybe swap with places sure. with uh, vengeance enemies or something so you put them somewhere that you aren't gonna yeah exactly to. um like that's the main use case i think for swapping enemies is an enemy you don't want to kill um, other i guess other I mean, than as an other than as an adaptable target i just don't know this seems very situational yeah yeah i think that's the thing right it's 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 in rogue, so it has the potential to be used in an adaptable situation, which is kind of nice. All right, I have a question. Does he have wings, or is there a giant pair of ghost hands picking him up in this art? Because it kind of looks it's... like there's something on his chest, like fingers. Oh yeah, those are I, fingers. I, <laughs> see, I thought that's kind of like superimposing the dragon's like rib cage over him, mm. kind of like he's like he's fading in, and like the dragon or wyvern oh, or whatever is like fading out. Oh it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a little dragon yeah. coming out of his hat. Yeah, I get it. Like I think yeah, is, I, think I think it would be fun. Like it'd be funnier though there. if it was a giant pair of hands just kind of like picking you up. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's no. definitely uh it's yeah i mean it, it's definitely very very cool art yeah. it's also just to comment a little bit on what we were saying about this is the only multi-class event i feel like that bolsters my theory that a lot of the point but, of the multi-class cards is to make synergy stuff work better uh i'm mistaken there are actually a couple other multi-class events but none that okay. we're talking but, about today yeah and, and not very many there's only there's think, there's very few there's, of them there's like two or three other ones yeah yeah i would i would love to hear about like more applications of this that i can think of because like some neat things that I can think of doing with this are like, let's say, you know, you're you're you've gone off, you know, like as as the uh, the the guardian or the or the monster handler to, to go murder stuff, you know, maybe Tony went off to murder his bounty or, or his quarry or whatever, and then uh, the seeker gets engaged with something, you can ethereal slip, they'll disengage from the enemy, right? This will pull the enemy off of them, and then now you're at their location, which is kind of neat, mm. um, but like. Or when you swap places, you end up in their threat zone. So you become an enemy. <laughs> so you're an enemy? <laughs> oh, yes. Tony Shotgun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I just, I'm kind of struggling to think of, of applications that you can use this where something like, um, you're saying that it's good in, in Forgotten Age, specifically, like, I'm thinking Do Doom of Edsley, if you're, like, evading things, you mm -hmm. might want to swap, you know, with an enemy that you previously evaded a little down the line or whatever, but, like, there's also, the, there's the new Monterey Jack one, where you just move free spaces, ignoring all enemy, like, engagements. Um, there's there's Elusive, which kind of used to be great, now it just is kind of a, you know, pair yeah. of tail wings. There's, um... Of there's astral travel which is kind of bad but it's like you know it's another option one yeah one one other potential uh reason for this is do you remember I, I feel like i bring this up every time we talk about weird cards that are like hard to find a use for but um echoes of the past where you have to like immediately rush and kill those stupid aloof jerks at the beginning sure, sure. like you could imagine like pl this being really good in situations like that I, but I, those I, aren't revealed though right uh oh, it has yeah. to be a reveal yeah. location no yeah. that's yeah man that's a good point the fact that it's revealed is like a huge yeah. handicap for this yeah i yeah aside of, maybe as an adaptable target for really specific situations other than that i don't think i'd ever play this <laughs> tony I mean, comrade in chat here's the spiciest brew 
Tony can switch places with his bounty. <laughs> that spawns the farthest location away. Well, it, it depends if it's revealed, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, my my thought is like on a look, on a map where you reveal locations already and you spawn some enemy at like the farthest location from you or something. Like you could have yeah. your rogue swap places with it to bring the enemy to your guardian to kill or whatever. Yeah, so it could be a way to like. I mean, rogues usually have like pretty good movement, so they can run back or whatever. And I guess in Monterey Jack, he like wants to move more than two spaces, right? Um, yeah, that is true. So maybe this is somehow a way to trigger his ability, but it is kind of pricey. I I think he's just gonna use Pathfinder any on chart for that, yeah. but yeah, or, or maybe like join the caravan or something. And but notably, this does say swap places, so it's not a move. I believe I believe it's different than oh, a move. Yeah. So if there's yeah. anything that like has a penalty to movement, like. Uh, or high gear or um <laughs> double reef <laughs> where where there's like that that forced plus two oh, cost you could use this to yeah, skip yeah. that yeah if, if, uh, if you hypothetically if you had some card that lets you just teleport all over the place and devil mm -hmm. reef that would be really good you know that would, <laughs> well, that, that, would that would really help yeah um, i mean i mean even that one in uh, double reef has the extra cost but this one doesn't and so that's that's the only case for it but let's uh let's move on though we got we got a few other cards to talk about all right yeah. we got um Jene, Jene Beauregard. Uh, yeah, I actually pronounce Jene. It has an accent over it. Mm -hmm. All right, great, nailed it. Uh, she's an intrepid explorer. <laughs> she is um a cost or excuse me a level three seeker slash rogue asset. Cost five. Uh, intellect and agility icon. She's an ally and a wayfarer. You get plus one agility and plus one uh intellect. Uh, during your turn, after you move to a location, exhaust, uh, move a clue or non-elite <laughs> enemy from a connecting location to your location, or vice versa. Two health, two sanity, takes up an ally slot. So I think you tried this card out at Arkham Knights, right, Dane? Yeah, there, there's one investigator, exactly one investigator that comes to mind when I think about this. Oh, it's Ursula. It's like Ursula's best friend. And we're going to talk about another card that is like best buddies with one I, of the investigators. I, I feel like I think, there's exactly there's two investigators. Yeah, I think there's at least two. <laughs> yeah, okay. I well, guess we can talk about the new cheese. No, no, I'm not even... I, okay, then, then three. I'm thinking of another one. <laughs> Who is Dan? Uh, oh, um, what's her face? Trish? What's That's so disrespectful. <laughs> what's her face? <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's, uh, we're not, we're not going to be playing tomorrow. I, I with thought, that I thought is, is she the only rogue that you don't like because she's actually good? Is that the kind of relationship that you have with Tish? Like she's betrayed yeah, I'm honestly the rogue, not pretty, the rogue not, fraternity not very psyched by being about awesome. Jack, if I have to be if I have to be real for a moment, but but uh, but yeah, no, this is this is like uh, when I saw this anyway, I thought of I thought of Ursula and no other investigator. Um, that's just me. But yeah, there's so many different applications. Like these two stats are, are really cool for Ursula, for Trish, for Monterey Jack, even just for like somebody like like um, I mean, even Mandy could technically take it because she has th three agility, so she'd be at four. It's not bad. The ability I think, is wild, though. I, I think Dane, I think you're actually kind of right about this being maybe only for Ursula, despite it being a very powerful card. And here's why: yeah, five resources is so much. That is a lot. It to is. me, yes. it, to me, the fact that this costs five, it's nice that it's only three XP, but the fact that it costs five resources means to me that you can't really like have this and charisma and another ally. That's probably just too much money. That's that's almost yeah. like Leo DeLuca money, right? Like I don't think you can yeah. you can't like play this and Lola Santiago and have money to activate Lola. You're just it's just <laughs> unless you're really rich, you're not gonna be able to do it, right? And no, like in, in Trish, this would be excellent for Trish. But I think Lola right. Santiago is like kind of even even better. Oh yeah, so, oh, she has the action I, ability, and I think that's kind of true for Finn as well. Like for Finn, I think Shanae would be good because you could use it to kind of have something to use Finn's free evade on and get pickpocketing triggers. But similarly, like there's just other options, right? And Mandy, Mr. Rook, like uh, as, as as really good as this is, it's just so expensive that I feel like you can really only take it if this is going to be like your only ally, and that means you know no Lola, no Leo, no Seeker allies. Um, I mean, if you're playing like a big money rogue, um, that's going hard into having large sums of money, then you could probably combo this with Lola and and Leo and still pay for all to get out. Like, yeah, may maybe. I just at try. that point, like you're you're playing a lot of cards that give you money, and then you're playing you're spending other actions to play cards that cost all your money, and at the end, it's like, where are you? 
Yeah. You know, like because because like plus two dollar sets. Well, but, but I'm saying like, but I'm saying like the big money decks want to actually have a lot of money so they can activate their whatever uh, dumb crap they I mean, have, right? It, it's, I mean, some of them are about like generating money so that you can spend chunks of money on stuff, and that could include playing assets. But um, yeah, maybe. Yeah. It, I mean, I, I I would absolutely love to have this in Trish because like I've been having a great time playing Trish in the the Return to the Circle Undone game with Dane. Um, but you definitely, you know, you, you, it's really annoying when you just don't have an enemy present and you want to trigger Trish's ability to pick up a free clue. Yes. Um, you, or maybe you do have an enemy, but there's no clue there, right? Like you, you kind of really always want to be on a place that has an enemy and a clue. And this is just so much flexibility that you can either move a clue or an enemy to you or from you. Yeah. Um, it also, it, it, it's going to help you activate your hiking boots like all the time also yes. is pretty cool. Mm. So like I I would love to have this in that Trish deck. I'm just really worried that like you're already spending so much money on other stuff, including activating Lola a lot, that yeah. I think it would be difficult. But I, I it would be great if you could make it work. Yeah. So I guess the thing that I was kind of confused about this this ability is like kind of unique in that um, I saw at the when I when I first saw this revealed only the clue part. The enemy thing is weird because when you move to a location. So let's say you're moving from location A to location B. It's after you move, you exhaust her. So is that after the enemy becomes engaged with you that you can move that enemy that just engaged you back to location A that you were just at and thus not not engaged anymore? Is yeah. that what she she can like just basically throw it over your your shoulder yeah. and you don't have to worry about that enemy? Yeah. That is really yeah, strong. Yeah. And I feel like that's, for a solo that's deck, cool. that's it's also that's it's also very funny. Nuts. Uh, yeah, totally. like like you walk into a location with a snake, and, ah, snake. <laughs> yeah, well, like why could why can she do that? I don't know. She's Janae. She could just do uh, it. She's yeah. intrepid, you know. <laughs> it is, yeah. It, it's it's kind of bonkers that she doesn't like. She's not one of these allies where like when you activate her, you have to deal her a horror or something, and you only get to do it a few times. Like you just get right. to do this for the turn. That sounds great. I, I, I'd be enjoy doing that. Um, yeah, and and I think um, in the in the chat, uh, comrade is saying. They're playing her in a, in a Monterey Jack deck. Oh, cool, a car alarm going off outside. Um, <laughs> I, I think that could be cool because, yeah, Monterey Jack, like, what other what other ally is, like, your kind of top pick besides Janae? Because you can't take Lola. You could take, you know, Milan or Jeremy. Like, those are good allies. But I think you do, in, in that deck, there's a pretty strong case, I think, to pick Janae. So maybe it's, like, maybe, like, Monty and Ursula are maybe, like, the top two that I think might want to take this. That makes sense, yeah. Yeah, I, the the clue thing is super cool. It opens up so many weird doors where, like, you know, if you have a victory location with two clues on it, suddenly it has one clue on it. You pull the location to the you know, or the clue to, to the location that you were just at. So now, get that clue immediately. Trigger your your hiking boots to go back to that location. It's just yeah. like a lot of cool action compression that you can do. I, with Janae. I feel like it kind of yeah, and it kind of affects your whole deck building setup too because it's going to yeah. make you want to maybe play inquiring minds where you wouldn't have before. It's going to sure. maybe make you want to play like forewarned where you wouldn't have before. Like it's going to kind of enable the kind of like drop and pick up clues thing a little bit more because you just have a lot of control over where the clues are. Um, and like Dane said, it's kind of like a, it's like a one card toolbox that also lets you kind of like move around safely and avoid enemies. And it lets you pick up clues efficiently and it lets you trigger all your other stuff. It's very, very powerful. Yeah. And I mean, that's not even like, so if you have like a shortcut in hand, right, you can, if, and you get an enemy spawn on you, are like, oh no, I've got an enemy spawn on me. You can shortcut to a different location and then use Janae to leave the enemy behind. It's like it's like Luke, right? That's great. Yeah. It's kinda neat. Yeah, no, that's that's really solid. And and so good in like I mean, earlier we were saying like we were looking at this honestly pretty bad uh, ethereal slip card and we were like desperately trying to figure out where you could use it and we were like, Oh, I guess in Forgotten Age, you know, it's good to move enemies around. This is like a card that does a bunch of awesome stuff and can do that as like a side effect. Yeah, like it's really it, weird that a yellow card compared to a card that's not a yellow card. Yeah, it's really, it's really strange, isn't it? I don't know, yeah. And well, I, oh well, I, I, guess we'll never, I guess we'll never really learn anything we'll never, else about We'll that. never know yeah. why. Yeah. No, yeah, super cool ally. Super duper cool. Uh, would it, one, one last question. Would you play this in any kind of rogues that aren't kind of like the standard kind of like, th there's a whole family of kind of like seeker rogue hybrid kind of uh, characters. Would you play this in like, uh, like, Tony or uh, Jenny or um, Safina? Like, would you play this in any of those? Probably not, right? I don't think so. Yeah, there's, just, 
it's a lot of money unless you're really able to use like every part of the card right yeah the only the only thing that comes to mind is like if you could play this in roland i would want to because yeah, he can oh, yeah. move enemies to locations that have clues on them and then murder them there so it would be it would be really good in roland yeah yeah, yeah. All right, let's uh let's move on to oh man, I have to read I have to read this one. <laughs> All right. It's, it's All right. Fine. So, we had this card initially at, as the first card we we're going to be reading. It's cuz double but quotes is the first later. is it, uh, earlier in the alphabet than A. Dude. This is this is very boring. Nobody cares about this. <laughs> Hit me <laughs> is a uh, level 0 1 cost event with an agility icon. It's a fortune and a gambit. It says fast play after you reveal a chaos token during a skill test. Reveal an additional chaos token switching its minus to a plus. If that token is a skull token, you automatically fail. Uh it's bad, folks. <laughs> it's not oh. good. It's, uh, it's just good shit. I mean, I, I guess the I so, guess the the class is it's in a clue, right? It's like, oh, oh man, rogue and survivor. Oof, that's that's Tennessee sour mash colors. Yeah. Um, it's not even Tennessee sour mash. This is this is like so so the thing is like a lot of people that can play this could play Lucky instead, and this is like incredible. This is like incredibly worse than Lucky, right? Yeah, like, 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 here's the scenario you have to build. There are no skulls in the back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, which, which immediately, which immediately rules out, like, three entire campaigns where there's three of them. <laughs> right, right. Well, Dream Eaters, I think, it doesn't start with skulls, is that right? Yeah, but and you get three pretty then, quick. Like, yeah, you get them, like, halfway through the scenario, but that's not the point. Yeah. The point is, is that, like, you basically don't, you're, okay, I can see the argument. Statistically, somewhere, I'm sure somebody's been like, oh, well, you know, you only fail, like, 30% of the time or something like or 28.2% of the time when when in, in this specific scenario and if you seal this thing then yeah blah, blah, blah. but like Dan just hit the nail on the head with, with the fact that half the people who could play this can play lucky right the other half eh, just no because <laughs> the thing you have to keep in mind is like okay if you draw a skull you immediately fail that's a that's hilarious right but if you draw a zero this just did nothing if you yeah. draw a, a minus one, then this did like barely anything. Um, it, like it's worse than lucky. If you draw a minus two, then this is basically the same as lucky. The chance of getting something, and it's random, right? You can't be like, okay, I, I know that I need this much to pass and lucky isn't enough, I'll play this. It's like, it's just, it's, it's unpredictable. And on average, it's quite bad. Now, if you're in like expert where there's a lot of really low minus numbers in the bag, then on average it's better like there's no zeros in expert sure. i think or there might yeah. be like one um it's not like standard where there's like three zeros or something it's just it's 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 crazy but i feel like an expert you just need better cards than this like i i, I think an expert you just you, you probably you, you want to avoid tests you don't want to play bad cards to maybe pass tests after you fail them yeah i think i think the main application of kind of like what this card is going for is that the, the rogues succeed by decks right like if you draw like a minus three or something and you were really hoping to be up by you know whatever for your quick thinkings and all that all that stuff um and you're like well you know like the whole rogue game is to take chances right and this this kind of embodies that so you get to like say well hit me and then you get a minus four hey do you get to do the thing that you wanted to do but like for players who want to do that play it do it if, share with if, me your your fantastic success stories and also your fantastic failure stories. It, it, it really does perfectly combine the class identities of taking like really unpredictable chances for no reason that probably don't have good odds and just abject failure at, at everything. Yeah. So in, in that sense, it's a very well designed card. Uh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's really interesting. So comrade in chat is saying just play premonition before this. <laughs> so so you like premonition to see the token that you're gonna get that you're gonna hit uh yeah uh, also, that's, that's also worth mentioning uh rex cannot play this right because it's a fortune <laughs> i mean thank god right like realistically like yeah, rex, rex with this, this card really out of control it. just shut the game Absolutely down at that bonkers. point yeah like, like worse than mandy worse than a lot of things um yeah but no I, if yeah. so okay so if you're playing a, if you're playing a game where there are no skulls on expert and a lot of your cards are like lost in the in the couch or something <laughs> then maybe, maybe maybe play this i don't know uh any anything else to say about hit me or what, what's the art going on there's a there's a card that's being magically changed from a six of uh six of, they're playing blackjack into an ace of hearts maybe 
he's changing like a king into a uh, uh, six so that they get a this whoever's doing that is, is about to get thrown out of this establishment because that's i'm pretty sure that's not allowed in blackjack i mean i'm, I'm just confused well, because i see there's yeah there's you can see a little bit of a jack of something of a jack of uh spades maybe you can also see like a six yeah. of diamonds and an ace of hearts oh, is there a lot of so oh, i see yeah. an ace and a five and a six i have a lot going on there I yeah. assume they were just magically changing it into the card that helps them or something, you know, to yeah. make them. Moves, I mean, like, but, I, um, I assume like the pile closest to the camera is showing fifteen, so you want to you want to find six, right? So maybe yeah. it's kind of like, yeah, like it's I don't changing know. into a six, but yeah, it's a it's it's a cool concept for a card. It's just very bad. Yeah. Maybe they'll print a, a higher level one, <laughs> or just be <play> lucky. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Let's move to the next card. Next one I'm pretty actually hyped about. It's called Ice Pick. Uh, very thematic for the set. Uh, it, so it has two different versions, a level one version and a level three version. It is a... Uh, what's that class again? Oh, Seeker. Excuse me. Uh, seeker and Survivor card. Hey, um, finally a bad Seeker card. It's, <laughs> it's a level <laughs> one card. I didn't even read it, Dan. <laughs> it's a level one asset. Uh, costs one to play. Has one combat icon on it. It's an item, tool, and melee. Uh, it's fast, and uh, as a fast action during a skill test while you're fighting or investigating, exhaust ice pick, you get plus one skill value for this test. Wow. And then the level three version, uh, the differences are that it has an intellect icon in addition to the combat icon, and uh, it says during the skill test while fighting or investigating, exhaust ice pick, uh, you get plus one skill value for this test. If you succeed, you may discard ice pick to have this attack deal plus one damage if you're fighting, or to discover an additional clue at your location if you're investigating. Uh, and both of these take up one hand slot. Um, yeah, so so this, I, like, I mean, we're always talking about how, like, what what card can measure up to Magnifying Glass? Because it's just universally the best Seeker Hand class card in the game that boosts your intellect, etc. Sorry, doesn't... The answer, the, the answer is not this. The answer is not this. Well, <laughs> hold up. What if you're playing Joe? Well, sure. Nobody but else. Joe also, because <laughs> Joe is, I mean, the Joe reason is the one case where like you don't even play magnifying glasses because you need to hold weapons or something. Well, no, right? but he he can hold tools, extra tools with, with, with his with his, with his uh, with yeah. punch guns, and this can give you plus one skill to his fighting test as well as investigate. So it's a little bit more flexible than magnifying glass. Uh, the upgraded version, I was thinking like York might like because he can, yeah, you know, it's. Uh, I mean, he doesn't benefit from the fast part, but it's cheap to play, and you could just keep recurring it to get an extra plus one damage or plus one clue. I mean, he Hello, friends. Damage. We've entered the Yorick zone. Uh, th <laughs> this, this is a card that was made for Yorick. Shouldn't, and, it, shouldn't uh, it be called like the, the 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 graveyard or like the grave uh, the grave spot or the? Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, yeah. even in the art, there's clearly somebody that is uh, digging a grave. The grave's, you know, a giant wall of ice uh, of some type of horrible monster. Um, but it yeah, reminds me of yeah. the 1998 film The X-Files, Fight the Future. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. I, I do, I like the level 3 version for Yorick. I think that's a fun, like, I, I don't know if it's, like, incredible, but I think it it's, would be pretty neat and it's worth it's worth trying. Yeah. yeah com Comrade suggests uh, Duke, because Duke can also hold this ice pick in his mouth when he's biting stuff. That's oh, that's point. true. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's actually pretty cool nice nice one with that uh comrade no yeah so like the thing about this in yorick is that um when, when i was playing that items deck and i guess so so there, there's a weird like asterisk after this items deck that i was playing because i didn't realize that geared up is technically worded in a way that would make it so that you can't like play backpack and then play the things off of backpack afterwards play a shopner's catalog then play the rest of it to like and yeah Obviously, that's the way coolest thing to do, and I really hope that that's the case. But technically, we don't have an official wording on it. So that deck has a lot of assets, and it's almost, almost a detriment to play non-item cards in that deck because right. you really such there's such an emphasis on getting as many cards out on the table as possible on your turn one with geared up and tour supply. Ice pick fits this mold perfectly because it's basically a vicious blow for for. Uh, for for Yorick, if mm. you, you could you could take away the vicious blows and just use ice pick level threes again, vicious blows are really good. But if you're going to be short supplying, maybe there's some variants that you don't like where your vicious blows are just going to be going away. Ice picks are just going to keep coming back. You know, if if you just play a solid weapon like a meat cleaver or something like that, 
you can just go to town on things and continually have this ice pick recurring and coming back. Um, the other option, I think, for me uh, that, that I'm pretty excited about is, is uh, Min, because Min has access to level 2 scavenging, so she can, um, she can investigate a location, uh, succeed by 2, exhaust the scavenging, immediately bring it straight back out into your play area, because level 2 scavenging puts it back out into her play area. So mm. that's so the only could, could be especially good in two player where like you, you want to pick up two clues at a shot if you can. That could be cool. Yeah. Um yeah, I, I think sort of like we were comparing the like the you know rogue survivor mix with the last card. My take on this one is that the seeker excellence and the survivor loser stink kind of mostly cancel each other out. And you're left you're left with a card that's like kind of mediocre mostly, but good for Yorick because of the you know you want everything to be an item like I mean, Nate said. I I think it's strong in people that want to do both investigate and fight because it it buffs those both a little bit. If you're trying to do pure investigators or seeker, then yeah, Night of the Glass is obviously better. But I think anyone that's trying to ride the line between the two, this is good. Also, I think survivors don't have as much stuff for helping boost their investigate. They have like for hand slots, they have like newspapers, but that. <laughs> That's kind of awkward yeah. to use, you know. So yeah. like, this is also an option, but they don't have access to magnifying glass. Like Bob, um, Bob's can't a survivor take... with he can't take this. Oh, damn, he can't. <laughs> God damn it. I, uh, I yeah. Norbertoid. Was funny. Oh, uh, 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 I was excited. It's like, oh, Bob has four ints. You know, this would he can't get magnifying yeah, glass. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. but but it is what this has in common with magnifying glass is that it's fast and pretty cheap, right? Yeah. So that. That it, like the fact that this is fast is a really big deal because it yeah, means totally. that it's it's just it's very like low friction and low cost to kind of like get it on the table. Yeah, I mean, I guess the, the, the other thing to add that that I actually just noticed when I was mentioning the Mindek is is hilariously that it it would uh, if you have Meltaroni, it will add another damage and another uh, skill value to your Meltaroni. <laughs> Not that you need it, but uh, you know it's there in case you're using this to investigate. You got the little stat boost. All of a sudden, big enemy with four health spawns. Get that get that Melteroni out on it. Use an ice pick. Somehow the ice pick like is launched with the acid, and that it'll you know murder it even harder. That's ice pick. Yeah, <laughs> there is. All right. Um, why don't we move on to medical student? Uh, so this is a level zero, uh, guardian seeker asset. Cost two. Has one willpower icon on it. It's an ally, Mysotonic, and science card. Uh, reaction after medical student enters play. Heal one damage and horror from an investigator or ally asset at your location. Uh, she has one uh, one health, one sanity, takes up an ally slot. Yeah, so, so this, this adds to the list of uh, expendable, cheap, yellow allies, right? And yeah. uh, I, guess, I guess to some extent, uh, Guardian too. It, it it does kind of fit into that uh what was that permanent that's like a weird version of charisma that the yeah. secret version that Miskatonic archaeology yeah, it, hell it, yeah it works for those uh, other than that i mean i don't know it's just there's so many good allies this is kind of a you're using your ally slot kind of just for this seems like it, that would be kind of a hard sell i mean maybe yeah. in larry like we might be running some disposable allies and you have the extra slots anyway like this yeah, helps you heal true. your helps you heal yeah, your cops one. or whatever or your guardian or whatever and then can soak a little bit and die you know it's yeah. it, it's also like if you're a seeker and you have one of the new weaknesses and you need to heal it a uh, horror or damage you know aside from logical reasoning for horror you don't really have a lot of ways to heal things so you might you might kind of be stuck taking this yeah so i'm I, i'm actually using this card right now in a deck i just started a, a run through carcosa with a tony morgan and uh I'm playing Norman Withers. Norman Withers? Who's the other old man? Harvey. 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 Yeah, that's another one. Uh, and so Harvey doesn't really necessarily need the intellect boosts. Um, but he things. really badly needs to not die those horrible weaknesses. Exactly. <laughs> On top of that, this this came in the set that has in the thick of it. So if you just take in the thick of it, take a damage or take both kinds of trauma from turn one, you're, you can just play this at any point in the game, and it'll give you value right from the start. The cool thing that that the reason why I'm playing this and all the like, you know, you got the um, the one that draws you two cards, which is three cards with Harvey, um, like an expendable ally slot essentially uh, works well with Jeremy too. Um, I have I have Jeremy in that deck and Jeremy draws a lot of cards for Norman, and yeah. Um, yeah. so uh, I'm using this. Uh, my friend who's playing Tony is using the uh, the decorated skull level three, and 
so all of these little expendable allies are just dying <laughs> on his spot. And he had, I'm not kidding, 15 charges on this thing by the end of the game, <laughs> in addition to already having drawn through through the deck. So this is a testament to Decorated Skull being a really cool card. But also, well, Medical Student, I'm just really glad it exists, because it's very versatile, very cool, flexible sort of a card. It, it also kind of illustrates the, the limitation of Decorated Skull, which is that even if you do manage to get 15 charges on it, now you have to spend 15 actions to like get actual value out of it. It's the level right. 3 version. I think the level 3 version is actually pretty good, because you can spend 1 to 3 charges and then get that many cards oh, and, I for, and resources. I forgot that existed. Yeah, that is pretty it's good. It's really good. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> In my cool. experience, my limited experience, was one game with it. It's very, very good. Yeah. Um, but Medical Student, like, Again, Yorick things, right? It, you can just have it die to Yorick and then, you know, heal somebody else with it, bring it back. Um, really cool applications with this. I'm really glad that this exists because healing a damage is something that is scarce in some classes. Yeah. Um, and the fact that it just does one and one and it's also a health soak for one and one is is pretty nice. I like the art quite a bit too. Yeah, I have no idea what she's doing to that squid. She's kind of like, looks like it asked her to the prom or something. She murdered it and turned it down think, or something. I think she I has know. to touch it, it looks like. In some, in oh, some okay, capacity, okay, okay. Which, which I would not be excited to do. Yeah, and yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I sympathize. Yeah. yeah, honestly, yeah, yeah. Milan's <laughs> probably looking like disapprovingly at her, but yeah. <laughs> All right, so, so we got one one more card left, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay, so we have. Uh, so this is interesting. We have uh, Michael 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 Pear. Is that how you pronounce that? <laughs> no. Uh, Michael Pear, experienced Michael. Pear. Uh, Screaming le pair. Level 5, cost 4 asset with an intellect icon, a pair icon, and a wild icon. He's a pair <laughs> and a detective. He gets plus 1 intellect and plus 1 pair. Uh, after you successfully pair, place 1 pair from the pair pair on Michael Pair as a pair to a maximum of 3 pairs. And then reaction when you initiate a pair, exhaust Michael Pair and pair 1 pair. You pair plus 1 pair for this pair. And he has three pair, three pair, and he takes up the pair slot. Is that is that right? The coveted pair slot. Michael, uh, did, uh, <laughs> it's, it's pretty. Eric it's Angel, pretty close. the artist of this card, did this to himself. I want I want this to be known. Ben, how did you? So Ben, when you were making the the slide deck for this, how did you come across this fascinating <laughs> creative visual artwork here that, that so, we're looking at? So. Uh, yeah, when I, I mean, when I make the slide decks, I usually try to see if I can find the full art for the cards, which I never can. Uh, but I'm usually looking through the artists, like Instagram and, or ArtStation, whatever they have. And on um, on Derek <laughs> on Derek's Instagram, he had this pair mixed in with like his like uh, you know like uh, body studies and like actual detailed art <laughs> commissions. Right. He just had had this pair randomly in the middle. I mean, of the <laughs> pretty detailed, honestly. <laughs> This is like a little more graphic than I would have hoped. It's 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 a thing that you kind of just can't look away from once you've started looking at it, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, those uh, that are those that are listening are not getting to experience. Yeah, this, if, if you're listening to pair, the audio uh, version of this, we'll we'll have to like post the pair the pair picture in the blog post or something, or, or yeah, watch it on YouTube. Or link to, link to you, Derek's you really, Instagram. You, <laughs> you really have to see this to believe it, or you're gonna think we're just crazy, which we're not. We're definitely not crazy. Well, no. we're we're a little bit crazy from looking at this pair. This, but like, this pair is sweating. <laughs> well, dude, the worm is is gonna eat him. <laughs> like, well, the, the, and the worm has a little. The worm yeah. has, oh, it's careful. It has a little bib. Like, <laughs> you know? it's it's really it's really something. That's all we can say about it. Is uh, wow. Well, okay. Now let's let's talk about the actual card. So I mean, I, I'm not gonna like re reread the whole thing, but it's basically like. <laughs> Uh, when you successfully investigate, you put a resource on him as evidence, you can have a maximum of three, and when you initiate an attack, you can exhaust him and spend an evidence to deal plus one damage. So yeah. when you when you, in, when you you successfully get a clue, it kind of fuels him doing extra damage when you fight, and he also soaks pretty well, and uh, he get, gives you both intellect and combat plus one, right? So yeah. that's, like, pretty strong, and this is kind of immediately really good for the sort of, like... Um, combat in like hybrid detective guys like roland and uh and joe diamond and joe. Yeah. yeah anyone that anyone's doing both investigates and fights this is strong for i was trying to like who who can take this in the, the expansion here monterey and lily lily so yeah maybe in lily if she yeah. you know wants to s be a hybrid and stack both but uh, i guess she can investigate with like um mystic stuff right like Lola yeah, mystic I, stuff 
I, I don't really see it for either of them, but I, I, I think, yeah, for Roland and Joe, um, I, I could see this being really, really good. And is, is there, yeah, is there anybody else? Combat uh, Nenda. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That, yeah. She, that could, she cool. could have both books and uh, uh, combats pretty easily. Yeah. Um, yeah, because, you know, if you can do, you might as well do four damage. <laughs> You might as well do four damage with the Melteroni, right? Um, <laughs> I mean, I, mean I, I feel like, so So I, I kind of think that if you're one of those characters, probably what's going to happen is getting the evidence is not going to be that difficult because, I mean, unless you're playing like a Roland or Joe build that is based on like free clues instead of investigating, which might be the case. Um, like if, if you're ever investigating, you're probably going to stack up on average like enough of these that you can activate the second part when you need it yeah um yeah i don't know yeah i know i mean th this it's a really good point uh that he has so much soak because roland maybe maybe not so much roland but but still roland um and joe don't really have great defensive stats like they're 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 uh kind of squishy in terms of like getting hit with rotting remains or something like that so um, the fact that he just has so much soak is also great because this guy can just soak like a lot of stuff, like two and two, which is which is a lot. Um, it makes them. him it makes him very resilient to the kind of ubiquitous like once per campaign encounter card that is like designed to kind of snipe your weak allies that you know like deal deal one direct horror to each of your ally assets or one direct damage or whatever. Like he sure, he's not going to sure. die to any of those, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Crypt Chills obviously like devastating for anybody who gets hit by it but like i i think the other argument in his favor is that for these sort of like hybrid detective trench coat kind of characters i don't know if there's necessarily like a obvious best ally yet like alice is is good definitely for some of these that can take her or you know guillermo like like all these are good but uh you know, I think you could you could definitely argue that that Michael's an upgrade. I, I would say it's kind of the same as Janae, where he's expensive enough and he costs enough XP that you might not be like playing him and some other ally in charisma. You might he might be like your only guy. So you'd have to decide whether that's worth it. But it, it definitely could be in a lot of decks. I think Joe Diamond especially, I'd be really excited to play this guy. Yeah. The the neat thing about him is that like you you technically like I mean, once you have resources on him, he's almost like a weapon in a way, right? Because once once you have a, 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 an evidence on him, I mean, he, he exhausts, so you can't use him multiple times. But, like, if you don't have a weapon or you don't want to use your weapon because you've got, you know, it's the hunch guns and you're, you're not ready to spend all your stuff on it because you don't have enough, like, the specific hunches out that you need or something like that. Yeah, totally. You know, you could totally just punch something and then have Michael lay exhaust, do his vicious flow, and then, you know... It's it's just adds more versatility and more uh, more good stuff to uh, Rowan and Joe who already are good stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, I don't it's know just who a... scandals on books like that though. Jeez, I, uh... who the hell does that? <laughs> I, know, I know a few people who would be very upset by this. Sorry. I think one uh, one I mean, type you know, of having fire in your books is actually pretty critical. So this is actually very smart. <laughs> I just I think one type of ally that is always like worth looking at and just always kind of seems like you you could build a deck around it is the ally that like boosts two stats and has some other like actually relevant ability sure. is just we've we've seen enough of those that like you can you can pretty much always find a home for those right like al almost always and that's that's definitely yeah. this guy's definitely an example of those any anything else to say about Michael it's probably Michael Lee maybe there is I think there's a yeah. isn't there a isn't there a director named Mike Lee, like a English guy who did like a? It's not, um, it's not Lay, like Slay. Uh, no. Slay Bell. No. I don't know. No. I mean, it could uh, be. I don't know. I'm not really an expert at pronouncing anything, so I don't know. There's uh, <laughs> like 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 Mr. Turner and a bunch of other movies. Anyway, it's no, yeah. pro pro probably a coincidence. Probably no relation. <laughs> All right. Well, that was our that was our last card for part one here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a lot of interesting cards. I'm, I'm still reeling about there only being one. Oh no, there's two. Hit me is another uh, event. <laughs> These are the two. Yeah. The two events. There, there's right? a couple I, events. I was completely mistaken. There's like four or five of them. Um, okay. I feel like we <laughs> we had some very high highs and very low lows uh, this this time around. Yeah. And also and also a pair, a very strange pair. <laughs> yes, yes, and, and a pair. Um, but yeah, so that's it for cards today. Um, we're gonna be continuing 
uh, next time with, with the second half of these. So uh, be there. Check that out. Um, tomorrow, 6.30, Eastern Daylight Time, Dan and I are going to be continuing our adventure through the Return of the Circle Undone. Uh, we're doing the campaign reading Destiny, so it's it's a pretty fun time. We're do, we're Trish and Rowan, and we're having a having a pretty good pretty good Tomorrow, time. Tomorrow, as in Friday, if they're watching on the stream, but today, if they listen to the podcast, or perhaps sometime in the past. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm talking okay, to the if, folks if, who are. If, 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 it's basically that kind of situation. But <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, very. Yeah. Oh, I did. What, what I did you... watch. I watched Tenet like a week or two ago. Pretty. Oh, what do you think? Right. Uh, I the first half I was very interested, and then they started doing some time stuff, and I was like, "Oh man, this is amazing!" But I hope you <laughs> I hope you watched it with like so, a hell of a surround sound system. Like I hope you really cranked uh, up the uh, had a decent no? sound, but not not incredible, you know. But yeah, it, it had Fair some enough. music. So yeah, I mean, let's put it this way: next next time is going to be our last time discussing Edge of the Earth player cards right this is this is gonna be the finally the last episode this is this is the the you know the the last then we get to do other things well and and also very ex <laughs> also very exciting the campaign has been released in some countries and Yay. supposedly is going to be out in the u.s in a couple of weeks so mm -hmm. pretty pretty soon we should actually have some thoughts to share about the edge of the earth campaign so that'll be really exciting oh, too i think the the player cards actually came out you know tomorrow slash today in the u.s which what is, is great what is time then i it's me it's basically meaningless it's always been meaningless <laughs> again um, tenet we, we all live in tenet world <laughs> <laughs> so uh what do these things even mean <laughs> well yeah anyway. if anybody has any feedback comments questions any about anything math time logic pairs pairs email yeah. us at comments at mbr.fm and we'll read your message on a future episode to stay current on what we're working on, follow us on social networks, including Instagram and Twitch, or join our Discord server. Uh, you can find all the links over at social.mur.fm. And if you really enjoy what we do and or want to get more involved, you can become one of our patrons at patreon.com slash Miskatonic University Radio. Or just leave us a nice review on your favorite podcasting network. Thanks to everybody who joined us today in chat, and thanks to everybody who's listening later in time or space or wherever you're listening from. We'll catch you next time. Bye, everybody. Bye.